I'm already so happy, y'all, to have Jessie B on the show. She's got a Chick-fil-A cup in frame already. Woman after my own heart. Hi, Jessie. How are you? I am good. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for making the time. And do you go by Jesse B conversationally or Jesse B? So I'll address you as Jesse B. Or Jesse or Jess or, or, Jess. Hey, or hey you or oh, whatever. Okay. All right. And that accent is bringing me back home. Your Southern accent. You're, I feel like I'm back in Georgia with you. Well, I am in Georgia, but what you're hearing is more Western Tennessee. Uh-huh. Um, yes. Okay. Yes. My mama's people are hillbillies and that's who I I identify most with yeah Yeah. is a hillbilly I love it (laughs) oh yes 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 I I, you know I'm a my mama's people are hillbillies and my daddy's people are sharecroppers we come from nothing but this is Tennessee this is mostly right it's Tennessee okay okay I don't know if you know so Nate couldn't be with us today but Nate is how I have found Jesse Nate has a tattoo I don't know if you know this that says hillbilly instead of hillbilly it says pillbilly did you know that (laughs) <laughs> I did not. I love that. that. Right? Yeah. I know. The first episode when I met him, because he was a guest first, and I titled his episode Pill Billy. It's spelled wrong. It's spelled wrong also. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. That That's makes just it so perfect. right. That makes it so right. I know. I know. I know. I know. Okay. Well, thank you again so much for your time and for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you and about your wonderful organization and to bring your cause and what you do and your passion, which I just found out off air, which we'll get to is inspired by something even deeper than I thought than her own story. But before we get to your organization, never use alone. I would like to start with your story, your background, where are you from? And let's talk a little bit about how you grew up and how you started using. So my mom's from Western Tennessee. My daddy's from down here in Southwest Georgia. Daddy did a tour and a half in Vietnam. This is going to tell you how old I am. Um, he came, he came home from Vietnam in 1972 and my mama decided to escape the hell that she was living in up in the mountains with an abusive mother. She, um, had the sheriff of the county sign that she was a year older than she was so she could get her driver's license at 15 instead of 16. She drove to Clarksville to meet the army recruiter to join the military. She met my daddy, who was the army recruiter. And 10 months later, whoa. Oh, my gosh. 1973. Oh, it's got chills. And you know what? Say what you will about the South, okay? In a little town like that, and y'all are going to hear my accent start just coming out and coming out and coming out. In a little town like that, some sheriff can sign a paper for a girl so she can get out of Dodge easier. You could do that in a place like that. They'll look out for you. They sure did. They knew what she was living in. They knew. And um, yeah. When she decided she wanted out, they were all about helping her get out, you know. So they come down here, down to South Georgia. It was a whole, it was a disaster, as you can imagine. Him just out of Vietnam, her just 18. It was a, throw it away, just throw the whole thing away. So they got divorced, blah, 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 blah. My childhood was hell. That's a story for another day. But lots of abuse, lots of abuse, not at the hands of my mother, but at my stepfather. So you can imagine where that goes. Mama's a nurse. She became a nurse in 77. I always knew I wanted to be a nurse. I've been a nurse 23 years. And I had a surgery in 2000. And back then you could get the good pills. It's with a phone call, right? Good pills with a phone call. And um, and if you're a nurse, who's going to deny you? You call your doctor and you're, I'm, I'm hurting. I got you, Jesse. I got you. And I got you. And I got you. And I got you. Well, I got got. I got dependent on um, Roxy's, Pharma Grade Roxy 30s. Oh, my God. When I was taking those, was the only time I didn't want to unalive myself. Dealing with just, you know, we can't, you, pain medication can't be used off-label for depression. But so many people find the only time they don't want to off themselves is when they're on opiates. And that was Absolutely. me. Absolutely. That yeah. was me. But I had an epiphany. I came home from work one morning. I worked in the emergency room. I'm an ER nurse, mostly ER corrections. I came home from work and um, never used at work, never had to divert. I didn't have to. I had a safe supply. I get as many as I wanted to. But I came home from work after working three twelves. I was ready to. It was like eight in the morning. I done drove. I I opened the medicine, opened the cabinet, took a bottle out. There's like three or four in there. And I saw this bottle of pills in the cabinet. 
And I said to myself, I said, now, Blanchard, if you call the doctor and he won't refill these, what you going to do? And I knew what whatever my choice was going to be would cost me my nursing license. My mama became a nurse. I was born in 73. She became a nurse in 77. I was reading when I went to kindergarten because I taught myself how to read from my mother's nursing books. I there's nothing more in the world than I wanted them to be a nurse. And I was not willing to lose it. I called my mama. I said, when you get off work, can you come out here to the house? I want to talk to you about something. She said, what's the matter? I said, just when you get off. Helen come in on two wheels. 20 minutes later, here she comes. And I realized the blessing and the privilege that is my mother because she helped me that week. And that was it. That was it. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So did you go to a detox or did you kick at your house with her just helping you? What was that like? I kicked at my house with Helen, me and Helen. (laughs) And that may, and that may be another reason why I never went back because I didn't want to have to go through that shit with her again. You know, there ain't no way I'm doing this with her again. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely not. No, it was, uh, I didn't want to go to rehab. I didn't want to, I told her, I said, I did this and I want to undo it. Okay. I want to remember. I could have, I got great insurance. I'm a nurse. I just did it at home. And so that's never been an issue for me again. I had my kidney removed eight years ago. You know, I've had other little surgeries here and there. I've had pain pills. There's no attraction at all anymore. Right. Yeah. You know, I've had a few surgeries too. I'm glad you just brought that up. I've had a few surgeries too. And my sponsor was like, don't be a hero. Give the pills to your mama. Just like you said, my mother lives nearby and saved my life too. It's a blessing and a privilege Mm -hmm. to have her. She was actually my guest just last week, but give them to your mom. She'll give you one or two at a time. You know what to do. And I didn't, you know, I didn't have any, I wasn't a pill person. I was a, a heroin addict, but still opiates. So how long were you using before this moment? So the surgery was in 2000. When did this moment happen? Two years later. Two years later. Okay. So you use consistently daily for, for two years. Okay. Did you take a week off of work? Did you take two weeks off of work? Did you go in sick? What did you do during that week? So I had worked the weekend. I'd worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I was supposed to be off. I was supposed to be off like Monday, Tuesday. I was supposed to work, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, and then be off the weekend. Mama said, just go. Thank goodness for Tennessee. Mama said, just go on and call him and tell him your cousin died. And we got to be up in Tennessee at the end of the week. Let's just take the whole week off. That's what I did. Okay. I went back to work the following Monday, seven days. Wow. And you were even around medication and pills at any point in time, you could have called back in a prescription. So how old were you at this point? I was born in 75, what, 30, 31? 31. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Were you married? Have any kids? Were you single at that time? What was your life? Yep, I was. I was. I was. Sing, I was a single mama to the most precious baby girl ever, who's now twenty three. Oh, cool. Yes, KB. That's what her name, KB. And um, she was there, and, and my family just rallied up. My sister, um, my stepsister, my stepdad that I have now, my good stepdaddy. They all rallied around and helped me with her while I laid in the floor and puked. Wow. Oh my gosh. I've had chills like five times since you've been talking. We're 10 minutes in and I'm enthralled with your story. I'm like leaning into the camera. But you know, that's kind of where it ends though for me for for substance use because it, it was such a flash in the pan. It was, it happened so organically. I used while I worked, while I took care of my baby, while I did all the things. But the minute that I realized, your next move is going to be something that's going to jeopardize your career. That's when I stopped it. And and I don't really, I don't know where the sense or the strength to do it came from, honestly. I don't know that I'd make the same choice if it were to happen today. Right. Okay. So prior to the pills, did you drink at all in your 20s or college age or nursing school? Little, did you party at all? A, a little, little bit. bit, but not much. No. Right. No. Okay. That's what okay. my thing. Now, my dad was, is a recovered alcoholic. You know, he has been in recovery since I was 17. He hadn't had a drop since then. Wow. Um, Okay. You know, mama was dependent on cigarettes. Damn, Virginia Slim 100s, baby. Uh (laughs) Woo-wee. Come in too late and she'd be sitting in that recliner. You see the red in uh, that red ember light up. You know, you're going to get your ass beat. (laughs) And then, you know, um, an Afrin nasal spray. Get addicted to Afrin and see what happens. That's that's some crazy. Really? Yes. Afrin nasal spray is. What, awful. What is an Afrin that is addictive? 
the oxybutyn. It's um, what it does is when you use it, I mean, it's wonderful. I love it. That's why I can't use it. It shrinks all that and you can breathe and everything's good and happy. But if you use it more than about two or three days in a row, you'll start getting rebound swelling. You have to use it like forever. forever. Oh, wow. Okay. That's so crazy. I've just heard Alfred twice in the last week. Another show I listened to the guy, nobody will get any ideas here, but the guy I probably shouldn't even share this, but here we go. The guy, I can't believe I didn't think of this when I was using, he would pour out his Afrin and mix up heroin in it and spray it so he could bring it with him on an airplane for a trip. And I was like, oh, I never thought of that. And then you just, you know, you just brought up Afrin right now. Mm -hmm. That's kind of funny. So you know, what's interesting about your story though, and I think this was so helpful in my own story as well. And so many people don't have the opportunity for this to be the case. Your purpose of being a nurse, your career purpose was a huge guiding light for you. I mean, it was the guiding light. Same thing with me. I'm in fitness. I teach spin and bar and other things. And one of my biggest pain point when I was using wasn't fear of overdose or, you know, it was, I would go on Craigslist on other people's phones and look at people hiring spin teachers or bar teachers and just shrivel up and die. It was like looking at the sun. It would like hurt my eyes to look at, mm. but I couldn't look away. I was so sad thinking I would never teach again. And that now I relapsed for years and years and years and years and years. It wasn't one moment, but my purpose kept me going. And I think sometimes what happens is people use so young, they start young they don't have the opportunity to develop a purpose like that. You know, I'm grateful that I had that early on. I mean, do you agree with that, that a purpose can be one of the reasons we get clean? I absolutely agree that, I mean, for me, you know, the purpose was the only reason I moved into abstinence and it remained, you know, opiate abstinence. You know, my daughter, KB, she went into active IV opiate use when she was 18 and she just turned 23. So that's a perfect illustration of what you're saying. She's having a hell of a time because she's just out there willy nilly. I mean, she's just out there swinging by her dick. She doesn't have no idea what she's supposed to be doing or where she's supposed to be going. And so yeah. she's just, you know, ping ponging around. So, yes, a thousand percent. Absolutely. And I think that becomes cyclical too, right? Like, so my husband started using at 16. So he's using at 16. You know, he gets into his 20s. He's been to prison twice for two years. You know, he's in his early 20s and he's like, I don't have any skills. I can't do anything. And so it's like a perpetual cycle because he's like, I've just been a drug addict. Why stop now? Blah, 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 blah. Cut to at 29, he stumbled into construction and now is like an assistant superintendent and is thriving. And that purpose that he found at 29 has really been able to like keep him stable. And so I think you can, people can get to the point where they can find that purpose and it can keep them clean again. We just got to, we just got to get them there and keep them there long enough to get there, which is what is a perfect lead in to what you do, which is about keeping our loved addicts because we love them. We love them. They drive us crazy, but we love them. It's chaotic, huh? but we want them to live. And your organization is in pursuit of that. So why don't you talk about your organization? There's this little organization called Never Use Alone. I don't really like the name anymore. We were thinking about maybe changing it. But we'll talk about that later. It's just kind of antiquated. People, people have got reasons for using alone, right? They got real valid reasons. But the game ain't the game no more. The game ain't the game no more. So never use alone. 1-800-484-3731. All right. So what happens is people who are using drugs, we don't want to die. We never did. Right? Not really. They call this 800 number. Somebody like me answers the phone. Never use alone. It's Jesse. Hey, Jesse, I'm so-and-so. Hey, what's going on? Have I ever talked to you before? Maybe, maybe not. I'm going to get their name or a name. I don't care. A phone number in case we get disconnected. Need your address. Where are you at on this big old world? Where are you? What are you using and how are you using it? I want you to unlock your door. Gary, I know. Trust me. Unlock your door. Put away everything that you don't need to do what you're going to do right this minute. Okay? Put me on speakerphone in case you forget you're talking to me and I have to start hollering at you. <laughs> Hello? You got Narcan, let's set it out. So in case something happens and somebody stumbles upon you, we got us a mask tool out there. We got us a blues clue. Do your thing. I'm going to stay right here with you while you do whatever it is you're doing. And if you become unresponsive, I'm going to call you some help. How long have you guys been doing? Also, I want to say that, and you know more about this than I do. I like the term never use alone. 
I knew immediately what it meant when Nate first told me about the organization. And to me, it doesn't necessarily mean other people have to be there. It means you're there on the other line, you know, and to not use alone, you know, so mm-hmm. I do kind of like that. Name. But so how long have you guys been doing this? And you started another, you had done something else prior to this, right? So what was the catalyst for the other harm reduction that you had started? Like your passion, it was born from your daughter's use, right? Okay. So they all came together at the same time for me. All right. Never Use Alone will be four years old this August. We're babies. We're still, we're just toddlers. We're preschoolers. But I don't know how many hundreds, uh, over a hundred thousand calls, something. I don't remember how many hundred thousand calls. Ninety-seven people have become unresponsive on the line and all 97 people are still here to tell their story today. Oh my gosh. I was going to ask you that. How many, how many known saves do you have? So, and you know what, I kind of glossed on this. All of them. That's amazing for my non-needle using addicts, because I was a needle using addict and I don't want to take it for granted that anybody misunderstands. So what she's saying is either smoking, snorting, or injecting. I could call you and say, hey, Jesse, my name's Janine or give an alias. You are not calling the cops. We want to make that super clear. This is not law enforcement. This is solely to keep you alive. You call the paramedics, not law enforcement. So I call you. I say, Jesse, my name's Janine. I'm injecting a combination of meth and heroin. Can you sit here while I, I mean, do you sit there? I'm sure sometimes it takes a while to, people to find a vein. They're doing whatever. And you just sit there on the phone with them. Sit there and talk to them. We chat. If they want to chat, we chat. If they don't want to chat, we don't chat. I just need to hear a purposeful response every 15 seconds or so. And it's going to look like me just saying, hey, Janine, you good? And you're going to be like, yep, that's it. Some people want to video chat. Some people like to video chat, especially the snorters and the smokers, because they're like, how do you know if I'm nodding or not? Well, I'm going to know, but you don't know I know because you don't know me. Right. So if you want to do a Jitsi or a FaceTime or what, whatever, I don't know. I mean, you're going to get what you get. Now, sometimes I'll be sitting here looking real damn crazy in a house dress with my hair in a ponytail. But I'll absolutely sit here with you. Absolutely. And we stay on the line until you think you're good and until I think you sound good. I'm going to ask you if you want my feedback. You know, If you're like, okay, I think I'm good. So what I tell my callers is this. I said, when you call me, you're talking in nice print letters, right? You're printing. Your voice is printing. Print, print, print. As you use, you may go into cursive, right? Then you may go to calligraphy. Uh, But I can still read calligraphy. But when you hit hieroglyphics, baby, when you hit the higher, when you hit the hieroglyphics, we're going to reel it in. (laughs) But you got the right to use what you want to. And you got the right to use how you want to. And it's not my place to tell you what to do. I don't, I'm not going to say, hey, Janine, I don't think you need to do that other line. I'm not going to say that. But what I am going to say is, hey, Janine, are you open to a little feedback? Can I tell you something? I'm hearing something different than I heard when you first called. Are you open to some feedback from me? You're going to say, yeah. Right. Probably. I almost said yes to you just now. I'm like, yes, Jesse B, give me feedback. (laughs) So what do you say if I said yes? I say what I just said a while ago. I said, when you called me. Your voice was printing. You were speaking to me in nice block print letters. And then you went to cursive. Now you're in calligraphy. And it's looking like old English calligraphy now. <laughs> and I'm afraid if you use it again and you go to hieroglyphics, I can't read hieroglyphics and I may have to call some help. I've had one person push back. You don't know me. I know what I'm doing. Well, I know what I'm doing too. I was calling EMS 30 seconds later. Wow. Okay. So, okay. You know, nobody. Okay. You, no police. All right. We don't have any control who shows up at your right. house. You know what I'm saying? If you call 911 and you ask for the ambulance, if the police are on the same frequency, they hear it, they're bored, they're in the neighborhood, whatever. They might roll up. They might not. I don't know. Now, I'm going to do everything I can to keep them from coming. I'm going to be bobbing and weaving around the words, semantics, trying to keep them out. But that's also why I tell you to unlock your door. Unlock my door. Mm-hmm. Because in some municipalities and counties, If EMS gets there and your door's locked, they have to call the fire department to bust the door down. Fire department might have to call the police before they can break your door down. Unlock your door. All right, low-hanging fruit, unlock your door. Now, Good Samaritan law. Most, I think all states, but seven, I think, and I'd have to Google which seven, have Good Samaritan laws, which means if I had to call the EMS to your house, you're not going to get charged a drug charge. You're not going to get charged paraphernalia charges. You're not going to get charged any of that. But I tell you to put up everything that you don't need before you do the do, because where you're probably not going to get charged, they're going to take your shit when they leave. I promise you that. 
If you got a bunch of stuff laying out, <laughs> you ain't gonna have nothing left when they leave. You gonna be just sitting, yeah, you, you, so gonna, true. You, you're gonna be sitting there real sad. Good looking out, Jesse. <laughs> well, because because then what you gonna do is you are gonna leave, right? Go and get you more. Might have, and you might have got the last of what your guy had, and now you're gonna have right. to go cold cop from somebody, and it's just gonna be even more reckless. So it's still in the interest of keeping somebody safe, right? Obviously, because you're gonna do what you're gonna do. Of course, of course. You're going to do what you're going to do. People say, you know, well, aren't you enabling? Don't this phone line enable? I don't know. Ask the 100,000 people that died two years ago of drug overdose. They didn't call the line. If they had, they might still be alive. And I've shared this one other time, I think, on the show, just to, like, put a face to this, because also why I asked for the person's story. It seems, you know, there you are. You clearly have your shit together. Even little things that are real adequate recognize. You got your nice headphones on. You're obviously on a computer. So am I like, you know, like we've obviously, you know, from outside perspective for all intents and purposes, got it together. It's hard to connect us to the past, but to like put a face on the overdose thing, because I I have a friend in particular, who's also kind of in this space and we can't even talk about harm reduction anymore because he brings up the enabling thing all the time. And what I want to say to anybody listening is this. So I overdosed once. This is long before like Narcan was just in your pocket. You know, I was in the men's room of an Angelo's Burgers in Oceanside. And I was with my ex, the guy that I used with all the time. And I overdosed. And he was turning around looking for a vein. And and he always would make this joke later. He was like, well, I knew she was overdosing because it was the first time she shut up in three days or something like that. So he turned around and I was dying under a urinal in Angelo's bathroom. And he is a former Marine and knew CPR and brought me back. And I was blue and probably going to die. And he saved my life. And I later owned a business, owned a gym during COVID that kept eight women employed during the pandemic, a single mom, two single moms. I brought value to the world that if I had died on that floor under the urinal, I would not have brought. And so it's like, put a face to that. You know, that's why you want to keep these people alive. You know, that's why you want to keep us alive. Who's this? That's my baby. Yeah. That's my baby. That's my baby. She overdosed Thursday for the 12th time after having been abstinent from opiates since November of last year. Oh, no. And I found out from somebody on outreach yesterday. Well, so the town that I live in is controlled by gangs, okay? The town that I live in, 80,000 people. So we've got Crips, we've got Bloods, we've got Crips, Bloods, we've got the Gangster Disciples, and we've got CME Rattlers. They control the town. Because of all the time I worked in the ER and because of the time I worked in a correctional facility as a nurse, not as a correctional person, I, that's not who I am. I've got a, you got a good name on these streets, Snow Bunny. Snow Bunny, because I was the white nurse at the jail. So you got a good name on the streets. And because I got a good name on the streets, my baby's got some level of protection. A member of one of those four groups came up to me yesterday and hugged me. And he said, Mom, KB, KB overdosed Thursday. He said, did you know that? I said, no, I did not. I said, but that explains why she hasn't called me in a while. Because I don't really talk to her a lot. I said, what happened? He said, she was downstairs. I was upstairs at the hotel. He said, it's a place, whatever. They ran up and got me. God, he come down. KB needs you. KB. He said, I went running down there. And he said, I'm not going to describe what it was, but it was what it was. I said, what did you do? He said, I started yelling at him, where's your fucking pocketbook? Where's your fucking, no, like, I guess he said, I guess they thought I was trying to try to rob her. I'm like, where's her fucking pocketbook? And he finally got her bag. And they're like, what are you doing? And he reached in and he said, I'm going to use the Narcan her mama gives her to save her life. And God, he revived her and she's okay. Wow. So that's, that's why harm reduction. If she had died Thursday or any of those other 11 times, what would we be doing? Right. If you had died, what would we be doing? Dead people can't do nothing, nothing. Stay where they're at, change, nothing. And even out there where she's at and doing what she's doing, I asked her one day last year, I said, KB, I said, how many overdoses do you think you've reversed? She said, like, count them? I'm like, yeah. She said, <laughs> she said I couldn't begin to count them. I said, 100, 200? She said, mama. She said, I've been on these streets how long? 90, 20, 20, 20. I said, about five years. She's I've reversed over a thousand, I know. Wow. Just as an addict, also armed with Narcan, 
you know, and that's why Nate does what he does, you know, and I've, I've learned a lot from when I met him. So I didn't know anything about harm reduction, right? I'm abstinence, 12 step person, you know, the whole deal, the regular, Mm -hmm. right? The thing they sell you on the brochure first. And I didn't know anything about it. And so when I met him, I was like, oh, okay. So you give him the Narcan or whatever. And then what do you do? You give him like a meeting pamphlet or something like that. And he was like, "Uh, no. And I was like, oh, what do you, why not? And he was like, because our only harm reduction is only about saving lives and quality of life. He's like, if somebody is like, hey, man, are you clean? If they ask me, I'll say, yeah, this is what I did. If somebody asks me, but my, our objective out there is simply to keep people alive long enough that if they want to get clean, they can. It's just simply about a humanitarian effort to, you know, increase people's quality of life. And he also told me that people that engage with harm reduction services like yours, like his, their rate of recovery, he would know the statistic offhand. It's like 70% higher that they eventually get to a place of, you know, I don't even know if we want to say sobriety, but let's say recovery, right? Where they're not in the same situation that they were in before because they've made connections with human beings and they believe that there is like life out there and that people care about them, and they're more likely to get better. Do you know what that statistic is? Is that true? I don't know what exactly. I mean, I know it's true if he said it, but do you know? Yeah, 64 per, the last the last statistic I read was 64% of all people who use drugs who have consistent access to harm reduction, to, to people to people like, like Never Use Alone, to my organization here in Southwest Georgia that I founded, to Nate, 64% of those people at some point do say, like, I might be tired. Like, I might want to look at doing something different. Well, actually, the number of people that say that is even higher. Right. But the of the people that get engaged with people like us, 64% of those people are going to say, and I know who to call because they already know my secrets. They already know what I do. It's no big, huge confessional. I don't have to go to these people and be like, oh, my God, this is what I'm doing and I want help. They already know what I'm doing. And they love me anyway. They don't give a damn. They keep showing up. They love me. So when I go to them and tell them I want help, there ain't nothing to that but to do it. Right. And then if right. if I get out there and try to get the help, and maybe I think I'm ready, but I'm not ready, and I have to come back to use, they're not going to beat me up or chastise me or make me feel bad about it. They're just going to be like, all right, what you need? Let's keep you alive some more. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. It's people change when change makes sense to them. And they are ready. Not before. Not one second before. We get out there with the stuff that we get out there with, the the never use a loan line, the supplies, the Narcan, all the things to keep people from overdosing, to keep people from getting hep C, uh, hepatitis, you know, HIV, endocarditis, wounds, blah, blah, whatever, whatever, whatever. We're going to try to keep you as healthy as we can and as alive as we can. You said until they blah, blah, blah. I say we want to try to keep them as healthy as we can and as alive as we can, period. Period. No exceptions, no exclusions, no limitations, no expectations. Me and my baby got into a fight. When did you discover harm reduction, Jesse B? Well, I tell you, as a nurse, Jesse B didn't know shit about harm reduction because we're taught abstinence-based, right? I became an RN. I went and got my bachelor's. I got my master's. I got a bunch of little letters. My name don't mean shit. Anyway. Got all these letters that were all taught abstinence. Drugs are bad. Don't use drugs. Come in the ER. Supposed to blah, whatever. Oh, the whole thing. That's a that's a whole another podcast right there. How we treat people in the medical setting who use drugs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's part of the reason why I'm not in the ER anymore because I was about this side of getting fired because of this slick mouth. Yeah. <laughs> I had doctors telling me that I wasn't going to be able to give my you know patients that were using drugs pain medicine and stuff like that, and I had to be like, mm, not today, Satan. Not today. And I had to quit, you know, I had to go, go on, goodbye. All right. So <laughs> not today. So she's out here doing what she's doing. You're going to come home. You're going to go back to school. You're going to blah, 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 blah. No, she wasn't. No, she wasn't. She wasn't going to do nothing I told her to do. Right. She didn't want to. I'm riding an hour before work. At this time I was teaching. I teach collegiately at a college. So I was teaching. I was on the way to work. I'd ride an hour before work. I'd ride an hour and a half at lunch. And I'd ride an hour after work. Three and a half hours every day, I would ride this town where I knew she would hang out looking to see a glimpse of my baby. I just wanted to Uh, see her. I just wanted to see her. Oh, I love her. I love her with my whole chest. I love my baby so much. And um, I seen her one morning. (laughs) 
I seen that little witch walking down the road. I said, I'm going to get her. I drive a Jeep Wrangler, four-door, top off. I got 80s hair metal music blaring out the top, just jacked <laughs> up, just trash, right? Just, just. I seen her. I jumped in lanes of traffic, pull up in the Krispy Kreme parking lot. Krispy Kreme's a donut <laughs> place down here now. She didn't, he- she didn't hear me because she had her earbuds in. And when I run up on her, I touched her on the shoulder, and she swung on me. And she threw her hands out to the side, and she screamed screamed at me now we are on the side of it is there is traffic there it is it's so good so good what the fuck do you want from me she screamed and i threw my hands out to the side and i screamed back if you could just not die that would be great yeah and that's when it hit me just don't die just don't die so then i was like okay well what do we need to do to not die narcan right we got to get narcan because narcan's Narcan is the anti-die medicine if you're using drugs. I don't know. I'm all I got some all I am is a nurse with a kid who ain't doing real good. And I got to figure out how to help I got to figure out what to help her, how to help her. Caveat to that is helping her was real simple. When I shut the hell up and asked her, what do you need? Well, that's when it got real easy. Well, I'm not gonna say it got easy, but it got easier. So anyway, I needed Narcan. So I wrote to the Georgia Overdose Prevention, and I'm like, hey, y'all, I need some Narcan. And they're like, well, we need a Narcan distributor in that area. Well, what does it mean for me to be a distributor? Oh, you get access to a couple million dollars worth of Narcan every year, you know, to find me up. So that met my Narcan problem. When they sent me my first shipment of Narcan, it had these little cards. It'll never use alone cards in there. Oh. And that's and I was like, what is that? What is this? I go to looking them up, and I'm like, yeah, people call you, and they do, they do what? And I got to thinking, and I said, and this is low hanging fruit. This is this is simple. Like, I'll just call somebody and they call the ambulance and you don't have to die. Like, this is brilliant. So I emailed the guy, messaged the guy. Mike Brown is the founder. I messaged Mike Brown. You know, he's he's you know taking time. He's doing something else. He's doing a whole other thing. So anyway, but I emailed him. I messaged him. And I'm like, hey, I think I want to do it. And he called me. He's like, yeah, hell yeah, Jess, yeah, yeah, hell yeah. I think you'd be good at it. Yeah, hell yeah. Next thing I know, 20 minutes later, my phone rings. I said, hello. This guy says, I'm looking for never use alone. I said, I think that's me. So I, the guy said, well, you don't get my information. I said, bro, I said, I literally just told Mike that I would do this like 15 minutes ago. Like, I don't even have how the fuck my phone is ringing right now. <laughs> He's like, oh, well, I've been calling since the beginning. Get up, get your pen and piece of paper and I'll talk you. So I was literally trained how to do never use alone by the caller before he. Now you make, sure so to, you make sure to ask people if they do this and you make sure to tell them to do that and blah, blah. We did our thing. Man's name was Steve. His name is still Steve. Steve's still around. Right. <laughs> I called Mike Brown. I said, I just got my never use, first ever use long call. How'd it go? Went great. The caller was very well versed in what I should be doing to keep him alive. Since you didn't, he was like, oh, 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 I didn't put you in. Did do your training? Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's what I, that right there. I was like, okay, wow. Okay, wow, this this man's safe. He hung up. He's fine. His life gets to go on. Yeah. Yes, this is the right thing to do because he was going to use those drugs whether I answered the phone or not. Right. So when I started handing out the Narcan, I started seeing the raggedy arms and blah, 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 blah. And, um, you know, and I, ooh, I bought a box of needles off of Amazon and I gave them to my baby. And I went around the corner and I just threw up all down the side of my pretty black Jeep because it just made me sick. But I knew it was the right thing to do. Because I had watched one of her friends try to sharpen a needle on a brick on the side of a building, yes. you know. So it just snowballed. And now I'm the founder of this 229 for Living Access down here in southwest Georgia. We are the only harm reduction organization south of Atlanta. And we serve our entire community, me and three volunteers. We go out every Monday, one day a week. And along with Never Use Loan Cards, we hand out all the things that people need to stay healthy and alive period. We do wound care. We do immediate HIV testing with linkage to resources. I mean, we do we do the whole thing. Safer sex. You ought to see me out there trying to teach people how to use dental dams on my hand. <laughs> they're like, they're, oh, like, hey, they're, like, they're like, how do you know all this? I'm like, mind your business. Mind your, mind yeah. your business. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious. Okay. So that's the second organization. Well, I have another question about Never Use Alone. So yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's 24 hours, obviously. Anybody yes. can call from anywhere. Yes. Okay. It's North America. And, North America. Okay. In North America. It's 24 hours. And does your daughter call it? Do you know? She used to call. Thankfully, okay. she doesn't. I mean, she she understands the importance of being with people now. Okay. She used to call a good bit, but she would text me and she right. would say, Mama, I'm about to call the line. 
I've been a nurse 23 years. Like I said, trauma nurse, correctional nurse. I, I mean, I, I can do all the things, but I don't know that I could listen to my baby stop breathing on the phone. I don't know that I could never use a loan my baby. I'd like to think I could, but I don't know that I could. So she would always text me, Mom, I'm about to call the line. And I'd say, well, hang on. And I would message one of the other operators and be like, we had a group chat. And I was like, hey, my baby wants to call the line. And I got to make sure I don't get her call because the calls are randomized. You don't know. I said, I got to make sure I don't get her call. I said, can one of you, I said, here's her number. Can one of you guys hit her up for me and take care of this. Okay. And they would. And then they would. And that's what I would, I would message her back. And I'd say, hey, somebody's about to call you and they're going to take care of this. And she's like, okay, mama, thank you. And then I would never, you know, I would, I would tell that operator, don't, I don't want to know who calls her. I don't want to know anything about it. She'll let me. And then and I would ask Kayla and I would say, promise me you're not going to do anything until you hear from somebody. If you hadn't heard from somebody in like three minutes, you message me back. And then when it's done and you're safe, will you just let me know all done? I'm safe. You should, you know, within about 15, 20 minutes, she's like, all done, mom. That was good. Thanks. Wow. Okay. So the other organization, 229, what is it? 229, Safer Living Access. Okay. Okay. And that's Safe Supplies and Narcan Distribution. And how do, like, if our people wanted to look up either one of these organizations or get involved or donate, where would people go look for these things? If Facebook's the best way, honestly, Never Use Alone's website's being revamped. So it's kind of, it's kind of helter skelter right now, but we have got an extremely, extremely robust Facebook presence and then 229 Safer Living Access does as well. And there's donation links on both sites. I have been 100% funded, self-funded um, okay. all this time. I get Narcan from the state. I get my safer sex supplies from the health department. Everything else okay. um, comes out of my pocket. You just buy the needles. I didn't even know you could order needles off Amazon. Also, that's another thing I'll put a face to. I had to use these horrible needles that were hooked and bent and not had to, but that's what I was using. They were like hooked and bent and I don't know where they came from because you can pull the stopper back and look like they're new and sell them. And we were buying them from shady people. And if I had known, and Nate does his thing right where I was homeless. And I'm like, if he'd been there, I would have loved to have gotten like, you know, cause at no point in time would I have thought, and only an addict I think can attest to this. I never would have thought oh, if I've got Narcan, I might as well keep using. It's not related. It's not related. Or if I have, because your life is still insanely inconvenient, right? Like it's insanely inconvenient to be a homeless drug addict. It's very hard to come up with $25 a day or $40 a day with no job and you're picked up and you're clearly a homeless person. It's very, very hard to like mob around town. So Uh the needle is the least of why I was going to use anyways And I've sharpened needles on concrete. I've tried Mm -hmm. to sharpen needles on the ground. And then, you know, I dropped one. Oh God, this is so gross. I made a TikTok about this once. I dropped one in a transit center bathroom, like the train station bathroom, cap off, needle exposed into a puddle next to the toilet. And it was my last needle. And I picked it up and I was like, kind of like, like wiped it off and used it anyways. That's right. Like That's right. the needle was, you know what I mean? The needle was unrelated to whether or not I was going to keep going. You know, yeah. what do you say when people say to you, are you just enabling people with this? What's your response to that? I mean, we kind of touched on it a little mm-hmm. bit, but if they, if they're asking me, well, don't you think you're just enabling? Yeah. I'm enabling them to live. I'm enabling them to live because they're going to do what they're going to do anyway. And then I invite them, you know, one of my, f- <laughs> One of my favorite songs is a song called Peace Sales by Megadeth. Can you imagine? That's, that's one of my favorite bands. Peace Sales. And the line that's in there says, if there's a new way, I'll be the first in line, but it better work this time. And that's what I tell them. I, you know what? I'm practicing harm reduction. I'm a community service provider. Our overdose deaths have dropped, oh God, 80% here in our town. EMS oh. calls have dropped. Our HIV rates are going down. Our hep C rates. Our hep C rates are spiking because I've got people being detected oh, and okay. treated. You see? Okay. And I got more people. Yeah. I got more people like, it's okay, let's go. You don't have to go to treatment. Yeah. yeah, you're going to the mental health place, but they don't give a shit about you on that side. We're going to go to the medical side, get your blood drawn, get your pills, going to poop on out. It's going to be good. And it is. And now the people are like, oh, you ain't got to go talk to the people. Just go get your blood drawn, take your pills. You're good. 
what I'm doing right now just by getting out loving on people. That's really all I do is love people. Just take some shit around. I just take shit around town and love on people. That's all I do. These people are changing their lives. The people in this town are changing their lives because they got somebody out there telling them it's possible. Showing up, pointing them where to go. I don't do shit for them. You know, that's the thing. I don't, you're helping this, helping that. I ain't help. They don't need my help. They need resources. Yeah. And the resources are there. It's just, don't none of y'all give a damn to go out there and tell the people where to get the resources at. Well, guess what? I can do that. Yeah. I can do that. If I hear somebody say, oh, I was thinking so and so and so and so, if you need to know who to talk to, let me know. Yeah. If you need me to put you in touch with somebody, if you need to drop a name, drop mine. That's all I do. And then they do it themselves. 23 years, 27 people in this town have stepped to a member of 229 SLA and said, I'm ready to do something different. Okay. One's, one's dead, died of endocarditis. I mean, the horse was out of the barn. There was nothing we could do. The rest of them are still here. Most of them are abstinent, but they've all got jobs. They're all stably housed. They're back having relationships with their parents or their kids. They got their, every one of them's got their driving license. I like my statistics. And if there is a better way, y'all let me know. That's what I say to the people who say what I do don't, what I'm doing is not working. Really go ask those people. That it is. I would wager a guess though, that you don't give your daughter cash or do you? Occasionally. Okay. Okay. And I t- but I tell you okay. how. I tell you how. And I tell you why. She has a. There is a limit on the amount of money I will give her in a month, and it's low. Okay. <laughs> like fifty bucks. Okay. Because what's she gonna do with fifty bucks? Nothing. But I'm gonna tell you right now. Nothing. Nothing. But if she's at McDonald's and wants a hamburger, I don't have a problem cash apping her five ten dollars. Yeah. Because what's she gonna do with it? It lets me. I do that for me. I do that because I am her mama. And I want to be able to do things for her. And I want to send her $10. I want to send it to her. Now, if she gets a hamburger, she gets a hamburger. If she goes and buys a pack of cigarettes, she buys a pack of cigarettes. I don't care. I don't care because she's going to do what she's going to do anyway. But if she goes and buys cigarettes with that hamburger money, bitch is going to be hungry here lately. And that's going to be sad for her, not me. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Now, now if she calls me and she says, Mama, if I don't have 20 more dollars on this hotel room, I'm going to have to sleep outside. No, you're not, because you got a house right here with me where I'm sitting. Where are you at? And I'll, go, I'll come get you. Funny how she don't need that. She don't need that ride, and she somehow works out them $20, you know. Right. Um, Mama, we're out, we're out of gas on the side of the road. You can just send me $10, Mm-mm, but I'll be glad to come pick you up. Where you at? Drop a locate. Mama, I'm so hungry. Could you send me 20 If I've already sent over her, over what I was going to send her. You know, or if it's saying like some bullshit, you know, mama, you know, I'm hungry, but you are in luck. I cooked the most bomb ass lunch today. You want me to bring you a plate? You want me to come pick you up? Come, you come home and eat. I'll take you back to wherever you're at. Can't you just send me the money? Oh, no, I got all this food here cooked. Why you want to eat that? No, I'm come get you. So I got my limit. Right. Because I want, if she wants a lip, if she sees a lip, a lipstick on sale, I want her to be able to go get that little lipstick if she sees it and she wants it. You know, what's she going to do with $50? I think there's no perfect answer to that. And it's Mm -hmm. about coming up with something that works for you. Like Mm -hmm. my mom paid for me to have a phone in the end because for a while I didn't have one and Mm -hmm. she didn't know where I was and Mm -hmm. was panicking. Mm -hmm. And she said, I do that for me. I pay for the phone for me, not for Janine. I know she's going to use it to buy drugs. I do that for me. And I think it's very personal and based on the dynamics of the addict and, you know, the one that loves them, what's going to work you know, for them based, you know, a mix of compassion and boundaries and whatever mm-hmm. is going to work for you, mm-hmm. you know? That's exactly right. I pay for phones, I, but at least I ain't buying no more phones. Lord Jesus, yeah. them phones, they get stolen, they get traded, they yes. get left, they, they get, get traded. Uh, and I just, I said, Mm-mm. she's, mom, I need yeah. a phone. No, no. I, I mean, yeah, you probably do, but you know, your mom is yeah. just not going, I mean, I finally went and bought her a, like a $10 track phone from the Dollar General and she, that's what I had. Mm-hmm. And I put the phone, yeah. I put 30, I put $35 on it. I put her a month's worth of minutes on it. And I'm like, look, here's your phone. Here's your minutes. You got a month to hustle up $35. She got 50 right. coming from me. If she just wouldn't spend it all on stupid shit. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. so she, but she works it out. She, she does all right. She figured, and most places got Wi Fi. Yes. Yes. She, that's she, true. She'll be all right. She'll be yeah. all right. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, so harm reduction for me. Why do I do what I do? I get asked as a mother. As a mother, how do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? How do you do what you do? 
with the whole the never use a loan thing and this and that and, that and this. Well, I had a never use a loan caller. I personally detected, I think, 27. I think I've called EMS 27 times. 27 people have overdosed on the line with me. All of my callers have my personal cell phone number. Every caller that's ever called never use a loan has got my personal cell phone number. They don't abuse it. They don't bother me. But they have it. I had a guy overdose one night. Called. He called the line. I answered the phone. Never use a loan. It's Jesse. Hey, Jess. He was already talking hieroglyphics. I knew his name, though. I'm going to say Fred. That wasn't his name. I said, Fred? Yeah. I said, baby, are you at home? Yeah. Good a boop. And there he went. Had anybody else but me answered the phone, he wouldn't be alive today. But because I talked to him so much, I had his address written down. And I was able to call EMS. And they were able to revive him. My phone rang the next day, and it was his phone. It was him. But as I was phone, I said, hello, it's Jesse. Jesse? Yes, ma'am. Hey, Jesse, this is Miss So-and-so. I'm Fred's mama. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I just want to let you know because of this organization, I didn't have to pick out my baby's casket this morning. Thank you. You know, a guy that was in Oregon, in a national forest in Oregon, and he didn't know where he was. And I'm like, well, can you tell me what you see, Home Fry? I mean, what, what you looking at? What, <laughs> like, can, 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 you get, can you drop some breadcrumbs or something? Come on, Hansel. Let's go find Gretel. What we doing? He's describing stuff, describing stuff, describing stuff. He used, I guess he got sick of trying to describe the scenery. He used and he went unconscious. Ugh. Unresponsive. Oh, he was agonal, agonal respirations. I went into Google Earth, paramedics on the phone. I'm Google Earth and all that shit. He told me he was seeing. We found him. Really? We found him. They busted the windows oh out gosh. of his. They busted the windows out of his truck and they revived him. I talk to him about three times a week now, and he's wow. abstinent. He's abstinent. He is. He's clean. Yeah, he's uh. in the damn forest. Hell yeah, he's abstinent. He's like. He's he's a bitch. He's he said he's a bitch. I ain't doing that no more. He said that. He said I won't never be that lucky again twice. I said you probably right. I can't believe you Google Earthed him. That's so. Uh, but like that's a mother. My mom would do that too. My mom would be like, oh no, oh no. She would. You know what I mean? Like a mom, she'll find you. She'll find me. I remember saying to the paramedics, they're like, we just don't know where he's at. And I'm like, well, by God, we're going to we going to find him. And he said, he said, Lord, you sound like you're a mama. Aww. I said, I am. And that's my baby. I said, he called me. We got to find him. We did. We found him. So it's yeah. those things that tell me. And now he's here. He's alive. He's abstinent. He's amazing. Doing such a good job with life. Killing life. He was dead in a forest if he hadn't called. Never use a loan. You're not going to tell me his life don't have value. You're not going to tell me I enabled anything but living with that phone call. The guy who overdosed, Fred, Fred's abstinent. Fred was trying oh. to finish. Fred was trying to finish an apprenticeship. He was in school. He was doing all the stuff. He was screwing up. He finished his apprenticeship. He's been abstinent a long time. Got the most beautiful girlfriend. His life's just so oh. good right now. Yeah. See? So, I mean, that to me just all makes sense. You know? Another caller Another caller is now um, been the director of a sober living facility for two years. They're in abstinence, just killing it, you know, and giving back, you know, and giving back within that same community. It's, you know, regenerative. I've got a I've got a national recording artist who calls me personally. Wow. Well, they called the line one time and they called the line for about five or six months using a fake name and everything. Well. Mm -mm. They called the line once. We talked for over an hour. They asked if they ever called back. Could they get me again? I don't know who it was. I had no idea. Asked if they could get me. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of randomized. And they said, well, then I probably won't ever call back. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Okay, hold on. What's the barrier? You're not going to hold me hostage here, but what's the problem? But the whole secret, it was real secretive. And I'm like, all right, look, I'm going to give you my cell phone number. You turn out to be a weirdo, I'm going to block your ass, though. Okay, you hear me? <laughs> they called me off and on for about six months before they finally, they finally revealed to me who they were with proof. Oh, and wow. I was like, I was like, oh, they're in abstinence now. I still hear from them every so often, you know, and I told them, I said, I said, what would it look like for you to talk to your peers, your fellow, your fellow artists and be like, y'all, there really is somebody out there that won't. I've been talking to this person for three over a little over three years. Not us living soul knows who they are and never will. We can keep secrets and we will. Don't die. We lose too many people, famous, not famous, unhoused, and nobody, nobody has to die. And I'm the best keeper of the secrets. 
We all are. Everybody well, that's on the line. Everybody that's on the line. I'll say this. I meant to say this one. I don't allow any. I'm, I'm the education director. I do not allow anybody to answer the phone who does not have personal lived experience with substance use. And you can still be an active use for all I care. You just better not be messed up when you're answering the phone. Right. Okay. You do not have to be abstinent. So when you call the line, you're going to get somebody who's been there. Been where you are. They understand the importance of no police. They understand we do not discuss recovery with you. If you ask for services, if you're like, hey, is there anything happening in my town? We got you. But outside of that, mm -mm, we ain't got shit to say. We just want you to hang up and still be breathing like you were breathing when you were when you called. The end. And that's that's it. Uh, I don't allow anybody to answer the phone that's associated with, with any law enforcement or that's associated with like Department of Family and Children's Services, because sometimes people call that have children and we don't care. You know, I'll sometimes hear, you know, they'll be like, I'm so sorry you hear my cat. I'll say cat. I hear that cat. I hear that kitten in the background. I hear that cat, 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 cat. We don't care. I don't care. Don't, I don't, 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 we don't care. We want you to not die. And you're being a real, real good parent if you're taking if you're taking the best measures that you can. We got you. So I don't nobody with Department of Family and Children Services, nobody who's mandated reported, you know, none of that. You do not ever have to worry. We do not call the people ever. Yeah. Yeah. Ever. And I think that's important for everybody it's to know. That is really important for everybody to know. Thank you. Cause you know, DCS I didn't even think about, but yeah, of course. Mm -mm. Is it volunteers that do it? Yes, we are all okay. volunteers, 100% volunteers. We do it from our home. Okay. We do it 24-7-365. If you call the number okay. and you don't get an answer, you're going to get a recording and it's going to sound really like a hillbilly girl that's probably living in Southwest Georgia now. That's going to say something like, if you're getting this recording, we're all real, real busy, but you hold on and we're going to call you back. And then you're going to get a text from okay. one of us. that's going to be like, hey, it's Jesse B. Hold on. I'm about to hang up. Be still. I'm coming. We'll call you right. We'll call you right back. Okay. Okay. And that's how somebody could volunteer. So if they want to volunteer, they can. You mean, I'm sorry. That's somebody that's calling. If there's no answer, you get that. And then you get back to them. Okay. And what if somebody wants to volunteer? Yeah. How do they volunteer. reach out? So there's a, um, there's supposed to be a volunteer form on our website. I know if you type in, if you type in never use alone volunteer, it's a volunteer interest form. It's just a quick little Google form. Nothing crazy. And you, just fill it out and it'll come to me and Amber. We know we'll call you and talk to you and, you know, you kind of got to know why you're doing this. Why are you doing this? Why, why, I mean, what's your right. interest? We got, we'll check you out a little bit, you know, um, okay. make yeah. sure, make sure you're good. You know, we'll do the training. We do a practice call. We listen to an overdose call together. We've got permission from one of our callers. It's an overdose call that I did. Okay. She lets me use that call in training. This is a fascinating little story. She got kicked out of sober living. She had been abstinent mm, 90 days, maybe. She went to a doctor's appointment, was coming back home. You know, when you're in sober living, you have to ask permission to do every little single thing. Well, apparently there was a store, like a, a Swanee Swifty or whatever. She stopped to get a Coca-Cola from her doctor's appointment all the way to the house. She didn't call, ask permission. Somebody saw her. They called it in. She got to the sober living. She got kicked out getting a Coca-Cola. All right. I mean, you broke the rule. I mean, that's pretty dumb, but you... You broke the rule. You know what it is? I mean, it's what yeah. it is. She went and picked up. She left sober living, went and picked up. She got home, got to a little apartment. She didn't have anything to use it with. She didn't have any syringes. The next morning, she went to syringe access, picked up all her supplies. She got home. Inside her kit was a never use loan card. She called. I answered the phone. Never use loan. It's Jesse. It's, it's public knowledge. It's all over Facebook. It's a huge, big thing, a big write-up. We've done interviews about her name's Kimber. I can say that without any problem. She signed a release. Kimber. She said, hi, I'm Kimber. I haven't used in a long time and I don't want to use by myself. I got you. I got you. 13 minutes into the call, I heard her fall. <sighs> She's the same age as my daughter. I called EMS. I stay on the phone with the caller. Even though they're, they're unresponsive, I keep talking to them. Kimber, baby, I got you some help coming. You hang on, baby. I got some. I'm here. You know, I pretend like this old voice can keep them tethered. I don't know. I mean, it's worked. 29, 28, sometimes. But anyway, I heard EMS. Not, not, not EMS. Anybody home? I hear them come through the house. They find her. I hear the paramedic say she's blue. Pull her out of the bathroom. When I hear, when somebody says, you got her, he says, I got her. I hung up. My job was done. Now, here's where it gets good. <laughs> All right. Later in the day, my best friend, Stephen Murray, who's a paramedic, who was the administrator for Never Use New England, 
called me or texted me. He's like, what up, homie? I'm like, oh, you know, we just here living life. What you doing? He's like, this is my Saturday to work. I'm like, oh, okay. We bullshit a minute. And he, I said, oh, by the way, I said, I had an overdose call in Massachusetts earlier. It went real well. He said, where? I said, hold on. I got to get my book. My phone starts ringing. He said, bitch, where? And I was like, bitch, I got to get my book. Hold on. Dog, I got to get my book. I opened the books. I was just stuck on stupid, right? I opened the book. And I said, and I read the address. And I, this, this six foot tall, 300 pound man, I heard his chest rack. He said, that was me. I said, <gasps> yeah, yeah, but see, you're smarter than I am because I'm still over here like, huh? I, uh, I said, I said, no, it was a girl. He said, no, bitch, it was me. He said, I'm the paramedic that responded. I said, oh, hold on. Stephen had put never use alone cards in that syringe access place two days before. Oh, my gosh. The bait, Kimber goes, picks up, gets the card, calls me, Stephen's best friend, best friend in the whole wide world. He becomes unresponsive. I call EMS. He was the paramedic on duty, the supervisor. He could have been in like a 90-mile radius. He was two blocks from her apartment when I called in. Oh, my gosh. That is so crazy. He went and pulled her out of the bathroom. Him and his team oh revived my her. Gosh. Him and his team revived wow. her. And he was like, he's like the phone laying on the sink above her didn't even trigger anything. But when she came to, he was like, you're okay. I got you. He is an overdose survivor. And he is now in his 15 years abstinence. Wow. So he knows how to, he's, he's compassionate. Oh, God, he's so amazing. But he's like, who, who was here with you? She said, nobody. Nobody. I was on the phone. So whoever I was on the phone with called EMS. It was me. Talk about that full circle. Is, that is amazing. Very That's cool amazing. Now she's in abstinence. Yes. She's in abstinence. Wow. She's moved to a new state. She's got her cosmetology license. I talk to her or hear from her every day. She's 22 weeks pregnant. Oh, got oh me a gosh. got That's me a grandbaby. So cool. Got me a grandbaby on the way. <laughs> she wants me to. She, oh. she lives, she's up way up in New England. She wants me to. She wants me to come be with her in the delivery room when she has her baby. Oh my gosh! So the connections that we make with people. Yeah, it's more than it's more than it's more than drugs. The drugs are nothing. You know, the drugs are the band aid to the hemorrhage. The right. People, the people use drugs to try to stop the bleed. Right. Yeah. We find the bleed. You spend enough time with somebody, you're going to you're going to start seeing blood trickle. You'll start finding the bleed. And if you love people the right way long enough, if they're open, you can kind of help them get pointed in the right direction if they want to. And who don't want to? Most time they just want, we just want somebody to listen to us, don't we? Yeah. So never use alone is just really about being who we needed once upon a time. That's so beautiful. Jesse, I can't, I can't thank you enough for your time and for sharing about your wonderful organization. Thank you. I mean, it's your, just, you know, we're just over here. We're just, I feel like we're just it's a little undercurrent, you know, where a lot of people are out here boasting about a whole lot of stuff. We're just over here doing a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Y'all need to get on Instagram too. My well, first thing was I went look three. Mm-hmm. Working on it. We've got somebody now. We, on Instagram we, first. we got somebody. We got somebody doing our social media now. Oh, cool. Okay. And she's friggin' amazing. That should be getting there. But yeah, okay. I'll tell her that you said make that a priority. Absolutely. Yeah, tell her I said that. Instagram, TikTok, the whole nine. Yep. And we'll you know we'll share it on our end. I'll share all of your Facebook two two nine. Stay alive. And never use alone. The Facebook profiles I'll include in the show notes so that people, you know, can connect mm. with you and I'll you know, tag you guys when this when this releases. I can't thank you enough for your time. And I learned so much from you. And I just it's incredible what y'all are doing. And you know, when I can get somebody on who can voice what harm reduction means and put an end to this antiquated enabling argument, it's so old. And when I can have somebody that can eloquently explain that, I just, you know, I, I appreciate it so much. I'm so glad that I'm bummed Nate couldn't be here, but I'm very glad that he connected us. Yeah. So I'll, I'll close my words with saying this. Harm reduction to me is this. When I go to bed at night, I lay my head down on my pillow and I close my eyes to go to sleep. Harm reduction for me means that I've done all the things that I know to do with healthy, loving boundaries for my baby, but with acceptance and support. If I wake up the next morning and she's had her final chapter of her life, if I wake up the next morning to find that my baby's gone, harm reduction is the thing that allows me to say I have no regrets about the way I loved my baby. And she left here knowing how much I loved her. 
That's what harm reduction is. It's very personal to every single person. But harm reduction is the thing that gives you peace at the end of the day to know that you did the best you could and that your loved one knows you did the best you could too. I love that. That's a great way to say it. Mm -hmm. I'm over here crying, thinking about my mom. I can't wait for my mom. To, she listens to this. And so she listens to the podcast and I'd be like, you have to listen to this episode. This oh. is like your long lost Albany soul sister. So oh. thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.